Welcome to the Fun Time Program. I'm one of your hosts, Vivica Volt, and this is my co-host. John Andrew Fredrickson with my fabulous podcast voice that I'm still working on here. <laughs> it's September, Vivica. It is September. September 1st, even. I, it's real weird. So I believe that means we're about to hit the six-month period. Did we hit six months in August, or are we hitting it in September? You really got to understand that time means nothing to me. So, so it was March 15th, so April, May, June, July... August was five. So we're about to hit the six month mark in, in the middle of September. Uh, I think that everybody's kind of been surviving this pandemic through the summer because we've been able to take advantage of the outdoors. Okay. Summer is wrapping up. It's now September. People are getting antsy to kind of try to figure out how to get back towards some sense of normalcy. People are getting back to work. Uh, September means that schools are reopening. And that apparently has been a really huge debate that's been going on across the country from K through 12 schools up into uh, up into colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. And here in New York City, it sounds like New York City is actually the only school district that is pushing for a full in-person reopening. Well, I guess that means that's what we're going to be talking about today. Isn't that's it? right. Today we're talking about school reopenings. And <laughs> this is this is such an, an interesting thing because, you know, we got hit so hard in March. The pandemic came to New York City first. We were the poster children for, you know, uh, how the, how this virus can spread and really, really um, change life. And, you know, we, we dealt with it. And now we are actually one of the safest places to be in the country when it comes to coronavirus. The uh, irony. The irony, right? <laughs> and, and so that means that now we're actually able to start talking about schools reopening in person here in New York City. A lot of the colleges have just completely opted not to. I know Columbia is going uh, fully online. Mm -hmm. I don't, is NYU doing in-person classes this year? I don't know. I don't think so, but I have not been checking in on NYU. To yeah, so so the, the it's interesting that the colleges in New York City uh, seem to not be um, as adamant about pushing in person classes. But when it comes to the K through twelve schools, uh, De Blasio, our mayor here, has been really advocating for getting the schools to reopen on time. There's been a huge debate between the mayor's office and uh, the teachers union, yes. uh, who just announced today that they came to a deal, which is exciting. Yep. So they're going to push back in-person classes by two weeks. So rather than starting on, on September 9th, I think was what they were going to do next Tuesday. 10th. The 10th. They were going to start on the 10th. On Wednesday. Um, they're going to now have teachers come in only uh, uh, next week. And mm -hmm. then they're going to have a, a week where the teachers are able to prepare their classrooms, uh, prepare their lesson plans and all of that. And then a week after that, they're going to have an orientation with the students um, where they're able to work with the students to figure out how they're going to guide the students in this plan for reopening and then on September 21st in the third week, they're going to actually resume in-person classes. But it sounds like some students have the option to stay home and do classes online somehow. So it's going to be like a hybrid plan, which is which is really interesting. But we've been reviewing this this debate over the past few days, and, and it's a really interesting debate because it's not as simple as saying, you know, we managed to figure out how to do in-person classes in the spring. Why don't we just continue it into the fall? So So what are the reasons why it's so important to get kids back into school, do you think? Well, I mean, some of the reasons that they're considering uh, sending kids back to school has been the fact that there is not really any alternative daycare options. Um, so parents that need to go back to work because businesses are reopening and there's uh, less work from home opportunities. There's not as many daycare opportunities and those daycare opportunities that are available are still pretty pricey, which kind of negates the parents going to work. You've got the food insecure kids who their only real hot meal or one of their only hot meals for the day tends to be from school. Although uh, we found out recently that uh, I think just this week. Yeah. Yeah. The free lunch program that happens over the summer has actually been extended indefinitely. Well, um, indefinitely well, means as long as funding lasts, legality and funding, uh, as long as legality and funding continues is the way they phrased it. And that's being run by the USDA. Mm -hmm. Basically, they're the ones who, who uh, keep food safe. Um, right. But apparently they run the, the, the food, uh, the school food programs, and they're going to continue that into the fall, which is really good news. Okay. Um, another big reason that um, people have been pushing for schools reopening is special ed needs because mm -hmm. obviously if you have um, a special education child uh, having an in-home um, caretaker is really pricey and is not going to be feasible for most people um, and sending kids back to schools you have the option of having ostensibly a free special ed caretaker and teacher that helps out with that um, so that's definitely a yeah, super big important. factor. Yeah. 
And then another thing I think we talked about was also um, for many children, uh, going to school is, is a way to get away from uh, unsafe or unhealthy uh, home environments. Right. And, and so, you know, the school system has been an amazing thing for so many families across this country and especially for families here in New York City, especially for kids here in New York City to mm -hmm. get exposed to, you know, positive environments where they can learn and grow. And, you know, as much as in-person learning has been something that we've been exploring over the spring and, and has, I'm sure, been successful for many kids and many families, there are many kids who, who are not able to really thrive in that environment because their home environments aren't conducive to it. I think you mean online learning, not in-person learning. I may have switched that, but yeah. but you get my point. Yeah. So, so, so <laughs> we understand why the mayor and many families and many parents are very excited to have in-person classes return mm -hmm. and be able to have their kids go back to school so that maybe the parents are able to get back to work because they had to keep one parent home during the summer right. because you didn't have the summer programs. Um, but, but I think at the same time, uh, the polling has shown that, that most, the majority of people are still in favor of not, not returning to school. I think it's something around 60% now um, are yeah. actually um, uh, in favor of, of, of continuing the online classes. So there is a bit of a split. Um, but, but what we wanted to do today is kind of look at how does this break down? Um, what are the kind of the pros and cons of going back versus not going back? What are the risks? Right. Um, how are the school, um, the local municipalities, how are they basically laying out the groundwork for, um, determining how it's going to be safe to return to schools and how to deal with any spikes that happen as a result of the school school reopenings. So we're going to break this down piece by piece and kind of go through this with you guys to uh, to to give you a you know our 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 take on where things stand and how we think that this is going to play out here in New York City as well as across the country and how it's already started to play out um, in the universities that have already gone back, some of the school districts that have already gone back in the South, as well as how it's played out across across the world. We've seen the in places like South Korea and Israel, um, they've, they've had uh, some challenges getting, getting their kids back into school without seeing huge spikes in, in, in COVID. So uh, where should we start with this? Well, so one of the things that we should talk about is like, what are, what does uh, online learning look like for this generation? And like, what are some of the drawbacks to it? Because we've already talked about some of the drawbacks to, or I guess like the benefits of going in Right. Um, but what are some of the potential drawbacks for staying online? Because obviously we know some of the benefits of staying online is, you know, you have a safer, less risk factor for COVID. It's a little bit safer for kids and for families. For um, some, not all. Right. <laughs> but some of the drawbacks is you have a lack of socialization with other kids, yeah. which when you're you have kids who are uh, in a developmental state, it definitely they definitely need socialization. That's why you have like play dates and stuff like that. So that's a big factor. You have the fact that it's a lot easier for kids to get distracted, especially when they're in their own um, home environment. And also the fact that there is not an across the board access to Wi-Fi in all homes. Right. So some kids don't have uh, steady access to the internet or if their parents are working from home, they only have one computer. So either their parents are working or they're able to do their classes. And it's kind of one of one or the other yeah. and uh, not both at the same time. So I'm hoping that as a result of this, we're realizing how important the Internet is for uh, the health of our so society and for the ability for children to be able to pursue opportunities in this world. And right. maybe we'll start to see a push for for um, making it a public utility. Exactly. Making it should totally yeah. be a public utility by now. And New York City's done an amazing job over the past few years of implementing these link access points where they have right. these incredible high speed Internet access points that you can connect to with Wi-Fi. And they're all over the city. But the problem is they're out in the street. You right. know what I mean? So so people don't have access to them unless they go outside and they stand out there. And in the fall, that's not going to continue to be feasible, obviously, as things get colder yeah i mean having kids sitting outside or sitting in like um sitting outside of like a starbucks or something is not terribly feasible and it's also one of the reasons why there's a push to not necessarily have all kids uh be required to turn on their cameras during class because you don't necessarily know what their uh environment looks like so if they're sitting outside trying to get uh, Wi-Fi access because they don't have access at home. It can be really embarrassing for them to their other classmates. And I mean, kids are already susceptible to being bullied over the stupidest things. So 
giving kids yet another reason to have uh, a bullying situation is not optimal, especially when you're already in such a tough environment for the kids as is because they're lacking the connection that they would normally have from getting to hang out with their friends at recess and lunchtime. But I mean, there are definitely positive benefits as well. I mean, I was homeschooled uh, for four years and that was before the internet was anything like it is now. And so my teachers were being broadcast across the signal on TV and I was able to like record them and watch them at my leisure, but I usually tended to watch them live, but it was a lot easier for me because they couldn't see me for me to kind of fuck around and not always pay attention. Hmm. Um, but I don't think that my ability to learn was diminished at all. Yeah, but again, you know, that's going to be on a case by case basis. And I, I think that the question here is how do we make sure that as many kids as possible have opportunities to the to, to schooling, mm -hmm. um, you know, in whatever capacity is best for them. And and in that case, you know, in person schooling is very important for many children. Right. So, yeah, it, it becomes a question of how do how do we get the how do we reopen the schools in a way that is safe, that's not causing spikes, that's not putting mm -hmm. teachers at risks, that's not causing kids to go in catch coronavirus, go home and spread it through their communities. Right. Um, so it's interesting to see how the different local municipalities are uh, putting kind of guidelines in place for how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, quite frequently, we've been seeing that um, people are quoting the uh, Harvard Global Health Institute uh, put out a document um, that basically talked about uh, what the different sort of risk levels are within mm -hmm. within the communities um, and what they recommend as being, you know, the best uh, kind of guidelines for uh, when you know that you can reopen schools versus when you have to maybe shut schools down because there's too right. much uh, COVID in your community. So they've broken it down by different risk levels here. We have a red risk level, which I guess means don't reopen schools, um, which is if you have more than 25 daily new cases per 100,000 people, orange mm -hmm. is 10 to 25 new cases per 100,000, yellow would be less than 10 and green would be less than one. Um, but we've also noticed that uh, New York City, for example, is uh, going to be judging uh, whether or not to be able to reopen based on the number of people testing positive uh, compared to the total number of tests taken. Right. So over the past several months in New York City, uh, the number uh, the, the positive rate of, of total tests has been in the one to two percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think de Blasio has said that we're only going to reopen the schools if it remains less than three percent. Right. Um, and so that's not necessarily the total number it's not it's not like uh, cases per capita, which is what right. the Harvard Global Health Institute is recommending here. It's basically percentage of cases uh, based on the total testing. testing. Yeah. So so that kind of depends on how much you're testing. Like you're not testing a lot. You're going to end up with a higher um, number of people that are testing positive mm -hmm. per total. And the more you test, the more. Uh, negative tests you'll get, which will keep the number of tests down, which I guess right. is good because that incentivizes the, the the city to be doing as much testing as possible to keep the total percentage of positive tests down right. compared to the total total number of tests. Um, it's interesting that, that Cuomo, I think, set the guidelines for the, the, the state of New York to be 5%, and uh, de Blasio has gone with a, a stricter um, guideline here in New York City at 3%. And it right. looks like so far we're, we, we, we've been staying under that number and, and New York City is on pace to reopen on schedule. Which is already kind of crazy as is because we were the epicenter for the beginning of this. And so when you look at how the cases are being handled, it's just interesting because uh, we have already seen from schools that have opened before us in other states how they've been handling it. So I'm sure most of you have seen the viral photo from Georgia. Yeah, we'll put this? yeah we'll put that on the screen. It's crazy. These kids are just swarming through 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 uh, the hallways, not wearing yeah. masks. They're packed not in. social distancing. They're packed in. And then what happened to the student that posted that photo? So the student that posted that photo got suspended. <laughs> um, also, that same student reported that um, other students were teasing the kids wearing masks and. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, taking masks off of each other. Wow. Um, and then within a week of that photo being posted, um, that same school reported nine cases of COVID and had to shut down for two weeks. So, you know, this is going to be an interesting test because if we're seeing that in half of the country, let's say in the red states, mm -hmm. uh, there is this perception that wearing masks is stupid. It's a liberal hoax. Right. And 
children especially are great at taking on these things that they hear and then kind of applying it to their friends and kind of enforcing it and basically making fun of people for wearing masks. And so if we end up with half of the country um, in the schools not wearing masks and not caring about social distancing, uh, and then we have in the blue states and in the cities, maybe they're taking it much more seriously. Right. I'm curious to see, are we going to see a huge divide in the number of schools that are able to stay open in the blue areas versus the schools that are not able to stay open in the red areas if they start getting these huge spreads of COVID? Or is it not going to make a difference? Um, I'm fascinated to see how that's going to play out over the course of the fall. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we can't really, as non-experts, uh, predict. Um, but I think that, like, if going back to our first episode about the mask debate, we, do, we did see the bluer a county is the more adherence to mask, to mask wearing, wearing yeah there was and also and the lower covid numbers there were right. over the summer so i think that there's probably going to be some correlation but uh we all know that correlation does not imply causation yeah um so it's going to be a little difficult to predict that but uh it's going to be interesting to see for sure um and some of the schools uh abroad like you'd mentioned before like in Israel, they opened their schools across the board and they saw a huge spike in their COVID cases when they did that. Yeah. And they started having to close school down. Same thing mm-hmm. happened in, in South Korea. Right. When they started reopening schools, they had they had a spike and had to close it down. But I think that since then, they've been able to figure out how to kind of keep the numbers low and have been ha- having more success in reopening schools. So, so it's definitely something to look at. You know, this is an experiment that's running across the, the world. And right. we're going to be able to look at the success stories. We're going to be able to look at the issues and hopefully be able to learn from them and apply them in our school districts here. Um, it's interesting to see that uh, in New York City, they they have very strict guidelines for what happens when um, a coronavirus case appears in the school. Right. Um, I think that if it's like one or two cases in New York City, they're basically going to close that classroom where the student tested positive. They're going to quarantine anybody who was in class with that student for 14 days and then hopefully be able to return return those students to normal classes. But if they have more than a few cases, and I think that they said that if they have cases that they can't identify where that student caught coronavirus um, mm-hmm. and they think that maybe they caught it from another student at the school and they have like basically rather than just an isolated case, they have, right. you know, a, a, a spike. Yeah. They're going to close down the whole school for 14 days and quarantine everybody. And I think that the idea is to then send everybody home for remote learning. So they're going to do this, this hybrid plan where at any point, everybody could have to go home for remote learning two weeks at home and then maybe reopen the school two weeks later if they're able to, um, to isolate everything and, and get people back in there. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. You know, is this just going to be a constant back and forth where it's like schools are open, schools are closed, schools are open, schools are closed, or are they going to have some success in doing this? And and maybe parents are, and people are going to get so sick of having the schools continuing to close that they're going to they're going to just say, you know what, if kids catch coronavirus, send them home, isolate whoever got in contact with them, and don't close the whole school. You know, right? It's just also uh, really frustrating because. Uh, Sending kids home, like, yes, of course, we want the kids to be at home when they're sick and have their family members be taking care of them. But a lot of these kids are then putting their family members at risk because um, we are seeing that kids can be carriers. And if they're getting sick and sometimes even if they're not showing symptoms, they can potentially be uh, carriers. Well, this is what's so interesting about the the difference between uh, reopening colleges versus reopening the K through 12 schools, because obviously the colleges have a much uh, easier time um, isolating uh, their student body from the greater community. So you send all these kids to campus, you test them all, you quarantine them for 14 days. And then if anybody shows up with coronavirus, you isolate them, you put them in quarantine, you make sure that they're not interacting with anybody else and they're not going and spreading it to the larger community. Whereas with the K through 12 students, they're going home to their families. Right. So if you send kids home and you tell the family to take care of them, the family's getting it and then they're spreading to other people. And you also don't know, you know, somebody gets it. And the first few days where they're getting sick is when they're the most contagious. Mm-hmm. And uh, we actually just uh, saw a study today that, that showed that children are more have a higher viral load in the first few days that they start showing symptoms than adults who are in the hospital who are super sick with the virus Which and the crazy. disease. So that means that it appears that children are actually able to be. Um, big spreaders of this virus. Right. And and actually, um, uh, over the over the summer, it looked like we were starting to see a majority of the cases or a huge spike in the cases was coming from the younger 
uh, generations versus the older generations. Yeah, people under 40 were starting to have a spike in uh, cases. And we're seeing that worldwide. The, the World right. Health Organization was warning about that. And now the White House, I think, and the CDC in, in the United States has also been warning about that, that over the summer, the, the biggest increase has come in the younger generation. So what does that mean if these younger, if the, the younger population is the population that is, is seeing the big spike in coronavirus and then we send them all back to school? <laughs> right. Because like originally we thought, Oh, you're only susceptible to this if you're over 50. Okay, well, now we know that we have 25 year olds who were perfectly healthy and uh, were in good shape and had no underlying health conditions being uh, taken out completely, um, either being hospitalized or potentially dying from this. So if we have people who are young and have strong immune systems that are being susceptible to this virus, and we're also seeing now uh, kids are having this issue. Originally, when the conversation about schools reopening was coming up, there was the idea that school that kids aren't susceptible to this or kids are immune to this. Well, I mean, or... I think we have the president actually <laughs> tweeting those oh, exact words. I really try and, to ignore everything he says. And, you know, it's challenging because that's, you know, that's contributing to the dialogue on this. And people are, are not taking it seriously when it comes to their kids getting sick or when it comes to their kids being potential vectors for spread for this virus. Right. So we, we've looked at, you know, how there's a difference in terms of the effect on the community when it mm -hmm. comes to K through 12 schools versus colleges. The other thing is that that people have many experts have have been saying and advocating for the fact that the younger children are the ones who need the in-person learning more than right. the older students. The older you get, the more adept you become at learning on your own and the easier it is for you to do in person or in uh, what's the opposite of in person? Online, Online learning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep flipping those in my head. It's fine. So, so the older you get, the easier it is to do uh, online learning. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is that when you look at who's reopening, it's actually kind of backwards. It's kind of backwards. Yeah. Uh, we we found that three quarters of the top. 50 largest school districts, K through 12 school dist districts in the country are opting for online learning Which versus in-person learning, whereas only 4% of colleges are going online. So that right. means that 96% of colleges are reopening for in-person classes. And I mean, from the, from what we've seen from the colleges that have reopened um, already, you have uh, places like Notre Dame where they reopened right. and saw a bunch of cases. Michigan State had that same issue where they reopened and had to then close again. But I think what's happening, at least in the colleges, is that they're reopening, they're closing, they're reopening, they're closing. At least they're able to keep all the kids on campus so they're not going back to the communities and spreading it. Right. The kids can stay in their dorm rooms, they can do online classes for a couple of weeks, and then they can try to reopen the school. Whereas in, in the K-12 through schools, I think that's just a, a much bigger challenge because you're sending these kids home to their, to their families. So it kind of makes sense... Right that the colleges are having an easier time of going back to in-person classes or at least are able to better attempt it. And, and it makes sense why maybe more and more K through 12 school districts are, are opting to go online, even though it's maybe not the best for the kids, it's right. safer for the community. Right. Um, so, so it's interesting to see how that's playing out across the country, but at least in New York city, we're going to get to see, um, you know, uh, one of the biggest and most dense school districts uh, attempting to go back to in-person learning and we're going to see how that plays out. Yeah, it's really exciting to see things. that, you know, the teachers union who has been really uh, threatening to go completely on strike this fall, if they weren't yes. able to see some of their demands met today, agreeing with uh, the mayor um, in, in, in a plan for reopening that hopefully enables them to uh, go about this in a way that, that feels safe for the, for the teachers. Because at the end of the day, the teachers are some of the most at risk um, people when it comes to this virus. I think we were, we were looking at the numbers on this. Do we have this on the board here? Um, yeah, teachers, 25% uh, of teachers have comor comorbidities. Mm -hmm. um, what else did we find? So uh, we also found that a lot of teachers are over the age of 40. And yes. um, a lot of the... Even like, over the age of 50, I think some, some high percentage of them. I, yeah, there's yeah. a reasonably high percent of teachers over the age of 40 and over 50, right. which puts them at risk. But also teachers from the studies that we looked up uh, tend to have uh, slightly unhealthier diets, which, again, leads to the 25 percent in comorbidities. And other people who are disproportionately affected by this are black and Latinx people. Um, but like the kids specifically, we found that Latina Latinx kids are, what is it, 5% more likely to be hospitalized and 
Um, black yeah, kids are like three percent more likely. I'm terrible with numbers, but like no, those numbers were much higher than that. Yeah, they were like we find disproportionately um, higher. Where not only are the kids more likely to be hospitalized, but they're more likely to be very ill and more likely to be uh, catching the virus, which is also really dangerous because they're going back home to their uh, communities and the people, the adults in their communities are also at uh, disproportionately higher risk of this virus um, and have uh, both of these communities have uh, a lot of comorbidities. Um, and I mean, a lot of those comorbidities come from a systemic level of uh, low income, which as well as uh, maybe not access to the best food, yeah. unfortunately. Oh, and so you end deserts. up with higher levels of obesity and other um, issues that cause you to be more susceptible to this virus. Right. Um, so the numbers here are uh, Hispanic children are eight times as likely as white children to be hospitalized, while black children are five times as likely to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also so happens that in those communities, there was a higher spread of the virus. So not only are they more likely to be hospitalized, but they're more likely to be exposed to it within their communities because of multi-generational homes. Right. And um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out, especially here in New York City, where we, we have large communities of, of black and Hispanic uh, uh, children. And, you know, we'll see how that plays out in the different communities. We also saw that at the beginning of this pandemic here in New York City, mm -hmm. um, I think that the first case of COVID, the first official reported case of COVID in New York, was on March 1st, which is way later than I thought. I thought we had cases earlier than that. No. But um, yeah, we well. closed schools. We closed the city two weeks later, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So there was about two March weeks 15th. of spread before we were like, shut everything down. And Little in late. those first two weeks, we saw 75 uh, Department of Education employees die and something like half of them were teachers, but die. other people involved like, in the schools. Not just get sick, and but that's like just in two weeks. die. And that's just in two weeks of spread. So, mm -hmm. so the question is, you know, how is this going to play out? into the fall as we start to see uh, cases spiking up in the schools. And hopefully they're able to, to really track and, and isolate those cases so that we don't have, have a, a big burst and spread that forces the closing again. Right. But of course, like at the beginning of uh, the spread of everything, um, teachers were much less likely to be wearing masks and um, face shields. Right. Um, Whereas and, now we know how to deal with this. Now we know right. how to minimize the spread. Um, the, uh, I think that they've been going through all of the schools and up, upgrading the um, HVAC systems, the heating and, and, and ventilation systems well, and AC I mean, units. Not all the schools. They've been trying to update schools, but some buildings are just genuinely a little too old. Some right. classrooms but, but the, can't be updated. But the yeah. point was the, 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 the negotiations that yeah. have been happening with the teachers union and the, and the city have been that the teachers don't want to be teaching in classrooms that don't have proper ventilation. Right. So the complaint over the summer one of the reasons why the teachers were talking about going on strike is that they were saying that they've been teaching in these classrooms where you can't even open the windows. There's no ventilation. Exactly. There's no, there's, you know, there, there's no ability to, for if somebody's in there with the virus, that it's just going to build up in that room and everybody's going to catch it. Right. So what they're doing is they're going into schools, they're updating these systems, they're making sure that windows are able to open, but they've also, um, the, the, the Department of Parks has, uh, based, I think just came out this week and said that they're right. going to uh, create spaces for teachers to do outdoor classes mm -hmm. when possible. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Basically, at this point, um, what we've seen is that the city is working with the teachers, is working with the Department of Education to try to figure out how to do this in as safe as, a, a, a way as possible, as well as putting plans into place for when COVID starts to pop up in the schools, how they deal with it. Yeah. Um, we know that kids can be carriers. We know that the, the, the spikes in cases that have been happening over the summer worldwide, as well as here in the United States, has been predominantly at lower age groups. Yeah. Uh, we do know that that has probably been in like the 25 to 40 year old uh, age group because of the bars. Um, and that's yep, been a huge bars issue. And parties. Bars and parties that Stop have been happening over the summer. Parties. Um, so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> basically right now, the way this school s situation is playing out uh, we really don't know how it's how it's going to go. Yeah, it's also uh, crazy because the rate of transmission with kids, even kids who are asymptomatic, are showing higher viral loads than hospitalized adults. Right. And that's that's such a crazy stat. I, I, I find that hard to believe. But we'll throw that study up on, on the screen. You guys can take a look at that uh, and, and, and you know see what you think about that study. Um, this was done in, in a hospital in Boston, I think. And they, they looked mm -hmm. at the viral loads of, of these kids who were showing symptoms. And in the first few days, they had higher viral loads than, than really sick adults. Which is also crazy because uh, we also know that COVID takes 
at least two weeks before you're showing symptoms. So these kids were can take up to two weeks. It can be as little as five days. Right. right, You're right. Sorry. Can take up to two weeks. Um, So if these kids after they started showing symptoms had huge viral loads, what was their viral load before they started showing symptoms? How contagious were they? Which we know COVID is very contagious even when you're asymptomatic or even before you start showing those symptoms. And what's unfortunate is that we just don't have good stats on that because you, you can't you can't run a study where you can like go and give 100 people coronavirus and test their viral loads up until they show symptoms. You can't t- start testing the viral loads until somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm sick. Yes. <laughs> so right. we literally have no clue what somebody's potential shedding of the virus is in that time period where they're asymptomatic, except for the fact that we do know that asymptomatic carriers can be spreaders. Yes. Which is uh, really cause for I mean, it's, it's, it means that, you know, we just don't know how this is going to go in the fall. But it, it is interesting to see that at least in New York City, we are seeing that uh, the mayor's office, the teachers' unions are agreeing yes. on a plan. They're, they're putting a plan in place. They have specific guidelines for how to deal with new cases that start popping up. Um, and it sounds like they're, we're just going to have to roll with it and, and see how it goes uh, right. this fall. And it may be that there may be extended periods of time where everything goes back to online learning. But at least they're making an effort where whenever possible, whenever the numbers are low enough, they're able to get kids into the classrooms. And 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 hopefully we don't start seeing teachers dropping like flies like we have seen some people writing opinion articles about basically saying that we're going to we're going to just start seeing teachers dying right and left as a result of this. Which um, I know a few friends of mine who are teachers have uh, started writing wills just in case. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, that that's how serious this is for the teachers. I mean, they basically know people. that, you know, these they're putting themselves under 40 doing yeah, this. They're putting themselves on the front lines, putting themselves at risk uh, in order to uh, get these schools reopened this fall. Right. Uh, the other thing that, that's really scary at this point is we just don't know what the long-term uh, effects are. We've already seen that that some patients, including some children, have had continued brain issues, have yep. had continued heart issues, have had continued lung issues. Yep. Inflammatory responses. Um, Many months after being sick with the virus. Some of these kids have been put in the ICU. Children being put in the ICU um, and are having uh, long-term lung damage, but and also, brain damage as well is yep. what's so scary. In adults, some of the long-term risks that we're seeing are potentially losing your senses uh, permanently. So some of the people who have lost their sense of taste and sense of smell have not gotten that back, even after they've uh, recovered from COVID. We're seeing severe lung damage to the point where it makes breathing really fucking difficult um one of my friends got covid in march and is still having trouble breathing properly and like walking up and down a flight of stairs is leaving her completely out of breath but before this she was running around all the time was a healthy person was able to like just run up and down the block and like run errands, no problem. And now she can barely get up a flight of stairs. Yeah. There's this syndrome called Guillain Barr syndrome, mm-hmm. which I may not be pronouncing correctly, but essentially it causes temporary paralysis. Which and they've terrifying. been seeing this propping up in children mm-hmm. um, across the country uh, in, in association with uh, contracting uh, COVID. Um, stroke. We're also seeing, um, yeah, strokes are happening. Also, uh, you have an increased risk of Alzheimer's and yeah. Parkinson's. Which they again, think I'm not entirely sure on, on how they're determining that because that's that would be a longer, even longer term thing. Right. But but it does appear that that is something that that researchers are, are very concerned about. Right. So the point is that that you know even if people are catching this, and they're going home, they're isolating, they're not spreading into their communities, and they're getting better. Uh, a certain percentage of them are going to have long term effects that we just don't know what that's going to be down the road. So right. the question is, what appetite does our society and do our local communities have for allowing people to get sick as as a part of getting back to a sense of normalcy and it appears right now uh that people have a high appetite for it we want to get things back to normal that's what i'm hearing from everybody um Mm -hmm. it's not just the president it's not just the you know the the republicans even in in blue states like like new york city people want to try to get back to work they want to get back to school they want to get back to living their lives maybe they're not going to go to the movies maybe they're not going to be throwing parties maybe they're not going to be having events but they want to at least get things back to some sense of normalcy. So Mm -hmm. the question is, how can we do this in a way that's safe? And how can we do it in a way that doesn't cause a huge spike like we saw in March? And, you know, as of right now, it just it remains to be seen how that's going to play out. 
we would love to hear from you guys what you think about, you know, how how New York City is approaching this, how uh, other municipalities are approaching this. How What's are they doing it in your state? Your, yeah. What's going on in your city? Exactly. Because obviously we have kind of a myopic view looking at just New York City. Yeah. But considering we were the epicenter, it's interesting to see how uh, New York City has been handling this across the board and how like such a large city and large school district is approaching this, but obviously yeah. it's going to be different in smaller school districts and uh, smaller cities across the country. So let us know what's going on in your neck of the woods. What's going on in your town? Exactly. And Are while you... this is, this has been somewhat of a serious topic today, yeah. this is something that's been on our minds. We've been having a lot of interesting conversations about it between us. Yeah. So we've been really excited to really dive deep into this, get a better understanding of how it's playing out. We, at least I have come away with a slightly better feeling about the reopening here in New York City, For understanding sure. how the debate has been has been happening amongst officials mm -hmm. and how they really seem to have a good plan for dealing with it. Of course, it remains to be seen how that plan plays out, but at least right. they have guidelines in place for dealing with these spikes so that they're not just going to be throwing these kids into schools, sending them back to their homes and being like, eh, we'll see what happens. So yeah. at least at least we seem to be doing this with good intentions. Right. And we'll see how, how that plays out. Yeah. Um, like but what? that being said, this is the fun time program. It's the fun time so program. So we promise we're not going to be doing only serious episodes like this. Oh, we have so many fun episodes in store for you, what especially you? coming right down the line. Do we know what our next episode is yet? Uh, I think we do. I don't know if we know what our next, it's, it's, next it's episode is. It's your, it's your like, birthday episode. Oh, yeah. I am excited. Well, I don't know if that's going to be our next episode, but like at least one of our within the next two episodes, uh, we're finally going to be talking about kink yes. and I'm really excited, um, especially because I am more than likely going to get to wear one of my latex dresses and I love being in latex. So, you know, just like Stay tuned. happy birthday to me coming up. <laughs> um, but yeah, we obviously want to hear from you hear what's going on in your world. Um, if there's particular things uh, topics that you want to hear us cover. Um, like this one, we, when we first started looking into this, I was very much on the, we shouldn't be sending kids back to school, yeah. uh, side of the debate. Yeah. And after researching this a lot more, I would feel a lot more comfortable about sending kids back to schools with some of the precautions that are being put into place. Yeah. Um, at I, least think I, I think York. I had the same, same progression in, in my understanding of it. It sounded like a terrible idea, especially the way we were seeing it yes. happening in other places right. where it just wasn't working. And it seems like at least here in New York, they are taking this seriously and they're going to, you know, uh, find a good way to do it. Hopefully. So yeah, we kind of <laughs> like doing these deep dives. So if there's something that you do not feel like researching all on your own and you want someone else to do it for you and kind of sum it up real quick, shoot us a message. No, leave us a comment. Maybe we'll make your dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> but so, from that us is, at the Fun Time program. That is it for today. And we will see you here in the next one. Have a great one. Peace.